Thanks, uh, Naylene and uh, Southern Regional Chad for having us come and, uh, you know, speak to y'all and share a little bit about our you know, journey. Um, so uh, I have a PhD in pharmacology and uh, for 25 years I did drug abuse research. And when we moved to Maryland, I started working for Johns Hopkins. And uh, while I was there on an ADHD study, and while I was there, Andrew was diagnosed with ADHD and he was in third grade. And so I asked a colleague that we were working with who was a psychiatrist who treated ADHD children, um, if there were resources for boys that were diagnosed with inattentive ADHD, because Andrew's not impulsive, he's not hyperactive, um, you know, he uh, is messy, uh, you know, not organized, um, you know, has trouble starting tasks, uh, especially tasks that he doesn't like to do. And when I asked this colleague of mine for resources on a, for boys with inattentive, uh, he said there are none. So that kind of led Andrew and I to share our story in our book, and I have it here, <laughs> um, Andrew's Awesome Adventures with His ADHD Brain. And it's about, um, it's Andrew's story about, uh, you know, living life with inattentive ADHD. And then my story uh, being a parent of an ADHD child. And I learned a lot writing the book. Um, that's kind of where a lot of my knowledge came from along the way is um, because I didn't really know anything about inattentive ADHD when he was diagnosed, because like most people, I thought, you know, ADHD was hyperactive boys. So, um, so you know, I learned a lot by writing the book. And I, I think that kind of helped Andrews in my relationship because we had uh, a lot of discussion about his ADHD and was we were, you know, very open about it that, um, you know, his brain works differently. It's not better. It's not worse. It's just different. And there are challenges that he was going to have to overcome, but there are also things he really excelled at. He's a great problem solver. He's very creative. And one of the things I admire most about my son is his fearlessness. He just kind of jumps in with both feet. And I think he really experiences life. And I wish I could be more like him in that respect. I'm Andrew, and uh, I'm a sophomore at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University studying space flight operations with a minor in human factors. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so I've had, I was diagnosed in third grade and it was definitely a task to get used to having ADHD and just like learning how to deal with it and that sorts. And the education system was not very catering to kids with my uh, neuro uh, diverse properties. It was just, they didn't understand it. And some of them just didn't want to try to understand it, which was the big thing is that it's okay if you don't understand what it's like, but if you don't make an effort to like help them, it's kind of like, that was for me, it was a struggle because they didn't, some of them weren't willing to uh, help me, at least in like a small manner. I think one of the um, biggest things is that you have to learn how to work with and not against your child's ADHD. When Andrew was first diagnosed, um, there was a lot of, uh, you know, why can't you clean your room? Why can't you put your bike away? Why can't you just come home from school and start your homework? And it took me a long time to realize he just, he couldn't do those things. That's not the way that his brain worked. And not because he didn't know how to do them or he was being defiant about doing them. He, because of the executive functioning deficits that go with ADHD, he just couldn't get those things done. So I think it's really important that you, you learn um, how to work with your child and you get their input are, uh, you know, in trying to help Andrew overcome his um, limitations from the ADHD, we were much more successful if we worked together and I got his input uh, and trying to help him organize, you know, he, he won't organize the way I organize something. He'll never put something in a, in a bin and put it on a shelf because he won't remember what's in the bin. He won't remember where it is on the shelf. And if it's out of sight, out of mind, he'll never go, you know, find that bin again. But, you know, I can organize like that. Um, but he, he can't. Kids with ADHD can't really do that. So it, it took me a while to say, hey, okay, how do you want to do this? What would work best for you? And I also think it's useful. You can give your kids choices, but don't give them 10 choices, you know, and trying to get Andrew to use a planner. Okay. So I got online and I looked up planners that were good for kids with ADHD and then narrowed it down to two or three and said, which one do you like? Because, you know, five or six is too overwhelming. They can't really make a good decision if there's too many options. Um, the second thing I would say is you really have to encourage and celebrate your child's strengths. Um, so 
you know, it's kind of common sense. You should pick a path that you're excited about. But in, um, you know, raising Andrew, I came to realize that that's critical with kids that have ADHD, because if they don't like it, they're not doing it. Um, so you have to find something that they're really passionate about and you have to push them in that direction or, you know, kind of help them choose uh, a path that has something they're interested in. So for example, Andrew's always been interested in space and space travel. And um, now he attends an uh, aeronautical university. Uh, so, you know, he's NASA nerds unite. They're all the same there. And, you space know, is he, cool. <laughs> he's thriving there because those, those kids are like him. Uh, another example is Andrew did marching band in high school. And, um, you know, so he had a group of people who were non-judgmental. He knew seniors, he knew he was a freshman when he started and, you know, knew the upperclassmen and, you know, would eat lunch with them and hang out with them before school because they were all passionate about music. So you really have to kind of get your child in an area where they're really passionate about something and, you know, and, and celebrate those strengths. Kids with ADHD hear negative comments all the time, you know, about their behavior and why can't they can't get something done and, you know, well, you're lazy or, you know, you're smart, but you're not trying hard enough. You know, they hear negative comments like that a lot. So we really need to lift them up and and celebrate their um, what they're really good at. And I think you also have to teach your child to self-advocate. I think that's huge. Um, and that's hard to do as a parent um, to back away and to let them, uh, you know, do it for themselves. You know, it was difficult for me when Andrew got into high school to kind of back away a little bit and let him learn how to deal with the challenges himself. And then, you know, he got to college and a professor told him he couldn't use a laptop in class. She didn't let anybody use laptops in class. And if he can't use a laptop, he's not going to take notes. And as much as I wanted to, you know, contact the school and contact the disability services office at the school and, you know, straighten it all out for him. I said, okay, well, I got to let him do it. So, and he did. And he I did it. It was great. Me. She didn't yep, complain. Like, I was like, she was like, what if you left up? I'm like, I'm allowed to. Yeah. Um, like two days later, he said, it's all taken care of. So, but that, and, and I think, um, the self-advocating also comes from having an open dialogue with your child. Like Andrew is, um, he's not embarrassed, obviously to talk about it. No, I love talking about it. Like, um, I was super so excited for this. So, so, uh, and I think that goes, uh, he, he really knows himself um, and knows what he needs help with and knows what he really excels at. And so therefore he's really able to self-advocate for himself. The, the thing is like the title of this uh, meeting is doing it my way. You have to do it the way that your child wants. And there's tons of good resources online for how to organize a child with ADHD. But again, that's a list of what works for other people. And all of us are all a little bit different. Even if you don't have ADHD, we have things that work for us that don't work for others. So you have to talk with your child and figure out what will work specifically for them. And you have to, and there'll be, for us, it was a huge like reign of trial and error for things worked and things didn't work. And it's going to be like that. Very, I feel like it's very rare to get something that is like, Eureka, this is what's going to work on the very first try. So you got to kind of feel it out and figure out what works, what doesn't work. And if it's different than your way, you have to accept that they're different and they don't, they're not going to do it. They have, they have to do it their way. Again, that's the big focus is doing it their way. What tools and treatment did you find most helpful to address ADHD? Well, uh, I'll start with treatment. So um, Andrew was on medication when he was in uh, end of elementary school and into middle school. And then when he got to high school, he, he asked to come off the medication. And we said, okay, with the stipulation that if your grades start falling, you have to go back on it. Um, but uh, medication did help him. He, he could focus better in class. He wasn't getting up as much. One of his kind of MOs was getting up and disappearing to the nurse's office or to the counselor's office because he didn't want to be sitting in class and doing the work that they were doing. And uh, a lot of that behavior um, disappeared. And, you know, like I said before, just um, working together with your child and getting their input. And I didn't realize that until a lot later. Um, so we didn't do a lot of that in elementary school and middle school. We probably really didn't start working on that until high school because I didn't realize how critical that was. But you have to get their input and you can get their input in elementary school and in middle school on how they would like to do something or what works for them. And um, you know, one of the best things that we did in high school, I, I think, and Andrew can, um, 
respond to this uh, as well is we made a contract that we both had a sign and we both had input in it. You know, we decided what was going in that contract and it was, you know, for completing homework. Um, and we both had to sign it. Andrew had to, you know, uh, you know, start homework at a certain time. And I was allowed to um, once or twice a week, I was allowed to check on his progress for things he was supposed to be turning in. And he picked the days that he wanted me to, to do that. And my biggest part was I wasn't allowed to nag him anymore about doing his homework. Which I'm um, sure was pretty hard for you. <laughs> it was very hard. <laughs> Um, but you know, the fact that we did that together and we both signed it made us both accountable. And I think that, uh, you know, that worked. So I was curious, um, what is the, um, so my children are young, um, and we don't have a diagnosis. I would ask, what is the first step to get a diagnosis? And also how, um, Dr. Wilcox, how did you all receive such a uh, specific, um, diagnosis as far as the type of ADHD? Well, our situation was a little, um, unique in the fact that when Andrew was in second grade, uh, he had a teacher who at the time had a high school age son who was diagnosed with inattentive ADHD. And she actually recognized some of his symptoms, the disappearing from class, the shoving incomplete worksheets into his desk. Um, and she called me in for a conference and discussed some of the behaviors that she was concerned about. And we went to our pediatrician and he said, okay, he said, well, let's write these down and let's, you know, start a paper trail and see if it's actually something or if it's, um, you know, just him being in second grade. And so when he was in third grade, we did have him officially diagnosed and he was actually diagnosed through the uh, psychologist at the school. And um, there was lists of like, I don't, I can't even remember how many, like a hundred and something behaviors that she observed in him. And she's the one who diagnosed him with, uh, inattentive ADHD. Um, the like hindsight is 2020. Um, now I would probably have had him diagnosed by a neuropsychologist who would be your best bet for diagnosing ADHD. And, th and they'll be able to tell you if it's um, inattentive or if it's combined type, which means they have some hyperactivity and impulsivity um, along with the focus issues, which is kind of what most people think of when they think of ADHD. And, uh, or if you just, uh, your children just have the um, hyperactive type. So yeah, so our situation was a, was a little unique in how Andrew ended up being diagnosed because if this teacher didn't recognize his symptoms, he probably wouldn't have been diagnosed in maybe even into adulthood because inattentive ADHD is difficult to diagnose because the behaviors affect the individual. They're not affecting other people. These kids are not the disruptive kids in class that are blurting out answers and, you know, getting up and walking around the class and, you know, constantly fidgeting. The, you know, these are the kids that are, um, sometimes they're labeled as, you know, lazy or apathetic because they're not doing their work or they're doing half of it. And, um, you know, they're the kids that will, will you know, you're smart enough, just try harder. They're, they're those kids. So, uh, we were very fortunate that that teacher recognized Andrew's symptoms and said something to me. And I would say that's, um, if you're concerned about your child, uh, have a, a discussion with their teacher. And, you know, once they're diagnosed, maintain that discussion with the teacher. Um, in Andrew's case, when he got into middle school and high school, I emailed his teachers every Friday. <laughs> and I emailed them in the beginning of the uh, school year and said, these are his weaknesses. These are the th his strengths. These are things that you will need to do for him. Like if you have um, worksheets at the back of the classroom on a table that you tell this class, okay, at the end of class, go pick up that worksheet. He won't go pick up that worksheet. You have to walk over and you have to hand him that worksheet. Um, and I asked him, I said, do you mind if I email you every Friday to find out if his assignments are up to date, if he's got any tests coming up, if he's got any um, projects coming up? And the majority of his teachers welcomed that communication from me because they really want to help your child. They want to see your child succeed. So they didn't have a problem with, with me um, doing that. So, you know, it's really important to keep an open dialogue between um, you and your child's teacher. All right. So somebody had in the chat, they asked if you can share some tools um, about school success, especially for middle school and managing homework is I will put okay uh like my class schedule in my phone 
and I can look at my phone and be like, okay, my class is at this time and it's in this room. And you can also get the Canvas calendar at least onto your, uh, at least for iPhone. It works for iPhone, probably Android too. But there's some some way of organization for either just like a calendar or a planner. Like my mom, she uses a planner and that's how she keeps her life in order. And my dad, he has a, he prints out a yearly calendar and each month writes in everything. So it's, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. But me personally, I like online solutions like uh, the calendar on Canvas and just to find some way that works for your child is the big, big, biggest thing I can say, talk with them and trial and error and test things out and find what works for them. And, and what about you want to comment on your one folder versus five folders? Oh yes. Yeah. So um, what I had is something called a, um, what was it called? An accordion folder. And it's basically a big folder. It's basically a folder with dividers in it. And you can just put like, I had a section for uh, homework that I had to do homework and assignments to turn in. And then I had each class had its own section in that folder. So it was really nice. One thing, take it out, find the right section, take out what you need. Bingo, bango, Bob's your uncle. There you go. Yeah. So that's an, instead of, you know, and this comes into the whole theme of this, which is doing it your own way. So teachers, a lot of times they want you to have a folder or a binder for their class specifically. So then, you know, you have an ADHD child that ends up with five binders and, you know, one is stuffed full with random things and the other ones are empty and he probably doesn't ever remember to bring any of them home. Yeah. Uh, uh, so using like a one binder system works really well. And it, you know, it doesn't, doesn't have to be that they're filing things in the right section all the time. Andrew would take them and just put them in a, you know, in a slot and then set aside a time you know, every Saturday or Sunday, okay, well, let's put the papers in the spot that they actually go in. Because I had a bigger binder at home that would keep all my notes and whatnot. I think it was a binder. It was like a filing yeah. cabinet, mm -hmm. something else at home where I would offload all of those notes so that way through the year, the the folder wouldn't be like four inches thick and weigh 400 pounds. You know, they, they spend so much energy all day long trying to keep it together and get through the day with their ADHD that they, they can't worry about, well, where does this paper go in this binder in this space? And then, you know, just have them have something where they can just put all the papers in. And then once a week, you know, you can sit down with them and you can help them organize it to where it's supposed to be. And, you know, don't, don't worry about the fact that the teacher wants you to have a binder specifically for their class. Like a lot if of you the email them and say, this is how my child does it. Because this is how they're going to be successful. I guarantee they'll, they'll let it go. Because like, you, there, there's no reason for a teacher to fail a kid for not having it organized their way. It's just, and if they do, then there's some other problems. Um, for those of us with ADHD, um, when you're a child, sometimes it's it can be worse at home. It can be worse at school or another, you know, another place. Um, my ADHD was extremely bad at school. Um, but it wasn't bad at home because there's less needed of you at home. So there can be this dichotomy where the, the, the parents and the teachers experience two different people. Yeah, um, and that's that's a fantastic point because most of the time uh, teachers uh, will recognize problems with your child um, and because you don't see it at, at home. I didn't really see those problems at home with Andrew because, okay, so you're not cleaning your room when I ask you to clean it, but you don't have to clean it right now. There, you know, there's no, there's not a consequence if you don't do it right then. So in a much more structured environment like school, a lot of these behaviors will, um, you'll notice these behaviors that you don't necessarily notice um, at home. And uh, to your point, Matt, when Andrew got into middle school, he really started to struggle with classes because it was, uh, you know, he was overloaded. Now you have to organize for well, from zero to hundred real quick six classes <laughs> and you have to change classes and you have, you know, so it, he did start to struggle when he got into sixth grade. So we were very fortunate that he was already diagnosed and could kind of help him along. And even with the diagnosis, he, he still struggled in uh, middle school. I even struggle in college with it. And I just got to like, there'll be times I'm like, I don't want to go to class. I just have to force myself to go and just get it done. I'm a school-based occupational therapist, and sometimes I do a lot of um, sensory processing assessments. And so I wanted to just kind of share with some of the younger parents that sometimes it's environment. Sometimes you have to modify the environment. It may not always be your child, and that child may not have 
issues in every class. It may be one particular class. It may be the, the, the overhead lighting. It may be the sound of the air conditioner. So we really wanna make sure that we're looking at all the pieces and not one aspect of the piece. And that's one reason why I like um, educational evaluations done by the school because we get to go into the classroom where they're really having the challenges and sit there and observe this child where they're really having those challenges and implement some strategies and speak with the teacher about movement. If you're talking more than 15, 20 minutes, you've lost this kiddo. And so mm -hmm. some of that you need to kind of think about as well. And then movement opportunities, you know, in the back of the class, if that student needs to get up and go into the back of the class and move a little bit, allow that to happen. Kids know what they need. Their bodies will get it. Whether or not they, you know, articulate that or not, their bodies will move. It's inside the body. I heard you say earlier about celebrating you know, which is very, very important. So how did you manage that? I would that? say that uh, when Andrew was little, um, the it was very difficult to find something that would motivate him. Um, and I think that's true with a lot of kids with ADHD. They kind of live in the here and now, and they don't really think about consequences. And um, so it was difficult to find something, whether we said, okay, well, you can have this if you do this, or if you don't do this, and, you know, we're going to take the phone away or whatever, you know, what are you take my phone away? I'll just go get on my computer. I don't care. You know, so it, it, it is, it is difficult to, to find. We always um, find loopholes, believe me. Like positive <laughs> reinforcement. Um, and, but I think maybe as they get older, that gets a little easier. So for example, Andrew's at his aeronautical university and knows full well that if he doesn't maintain good grades, that he's not I'm gonna here. To stay there. <laughs> he's coming I love home. it here. I love it here. Um, so I think as they get older, that gets a little bit easier. But I saw someone was kind of com conversing back and forth with you about your decision to stop taking medication. And I know, um, Dr. Wilcox, you mentioned that you guys decided to stop taking medication like upon interest into high school. So could you all talk more about what went into that decision-making process and Andrew, what that was like for you um, coming off the medication and learning how to like utilize your coping skills? Yeah, if you guys haven't seen the chat, I wanted to work towards being more independent. I didn't want to be on, be on it my whole life. I just didn't, it just wasn't my thing. And uh, I mean, the one thing is that one of the other reasons is I had some negative side effects, like the big one, at least now, is uh, I would lose my appetite for lunch. So I would almost never eat lunch. When I was on it, and uh, and one of the f second half of that is how did you, how did I do without it? Uh, I mean, I graduated high school and they let me in here, so I think I did pretty good for myself. But uh, it was definitely for me, it was a quick adjustment, and um, but it's different. I'd imagine it's different for everybody because I had tools and techniques established before I went off the medication, and I continued to build on those after. It wasn't like I stopped and I just went with what I had. I continued to be like, okay, this isn't working. Let's tweak a little bit, see how it goes. A little bit of testing and it's like okay you kind of just test and retest and change things and uh yeah so it's just you got to build the skills before you go off of it if you're deciding to and you got to keep improving on them and stay with them after you get off because if you have these tools and you just don't do any of them after then what's the point it's not uncommon for kids when they get to high school to ask to come off their medication um, I didn't know that at the time Andrew asked but then uh, there is uh, some research articles out out there that do uh, you know, say that they do ask to stop taking medication, whether it makes them feel awkward because now they're in high school and they don't want to be made fun of um, for taking ADHD medication or they, uh, and it's their perception that they can do it without the medication. But what um, one study actually found is that uh, these kids that said that they could do better off the medication actually didn't. They did better when they were on the medication. So they kind of have a little bit of a misperception of how the medication is helping them when they get older. So, um, and, you know, we just told Andrew if he, his grades started dropping, he was going to have to go back on the medication. And he did take all AP and honors classes in high school. Um, <clears throat> and he did manage to graduate with a you know, a three point what one or something like that. I actually did ask Andrew if he wanted to go back on it when he went to college, not knowing how, you know, college is difficult. You know, he said maybe, but we didn't really do it because one of the things I pointed out to him, I said, you're going to have to remember to take it every day. You know, you don't have mom putting it out with your breakfast. You're going to have to remember that you got to take this every day. How has your, like, how do you navigate sleep? Did you have any problems with sleep as a child and then into your high school 
and um, young adult years. He didn't really have a problem go, like going to sleep. He's kind of like a night owl and he likes to, to stay up later and, you know, get up later. Um, but uh, I didn't really observe any, you know, lots of problems with the restlessness and can't shut off his mind and can't go to sleep. And, you know, I, did you feel that way, Andrew? I don't know. I mean, some nights I can't sleep and other nights I'm like, I fall asleep, I start falling asleep in my chair, talk to my friends. I'm like, all right, I need to go to bed. <laughs> like I'll be sitting here, I'll be completely out. I'll wake up and I'm like, I need to go to bed. And I'm like, I, I can't function anymore. And other nights, like last night, I was up till like two because I just could not get myself to fall asleep no matter how hard I tried. Um, someone is asking, did you choose college based on ADHD services, available accommodations? So we did not choose the college based on the disability services offered. Um, so each school, it's my understanding that every college has to have basic services and some offer more services than others. Um, he does go to a very small private university. You know, he's had professors ask, are there, you know, how, what do you think about the class? Is there anything that, you know... We, I could be doing better. And I think it, when Andrew responded to one of them that, you know, he wished that the professor used more visual examples of the material being taught. And he said, so the professor started doing that. Um, they can take those the feedback when they don't have 10 lectures a day, each with 50 kids, and they don't have time to comb through 500 responses here. It's the lectures are only 25 or 30 kids. And they only have three lectures per day. So it's way, way smaller. Um, but I would say in terms of college, you know, contact the disability services offices at, at the colleges that your child is interested in and, and talk to them, set up an interview and see what accommodations are available for your um, for your son or daughter. And, um, you know, see whether the, the college requires your son or daughter to get reevaluated for their ADHD in order to receive services. We were lucky that um, his college accepted his 504 um, plan as that he still had ADHD and that therefore he qualified for services at their school. But some schools will require you to get your son or daughter re-diagnosed um, before they will provide services for them. But yeah, talk to the, the you know, the services office and say, hey, you know, what, um, what do you, what do you offer? What accommodations can my child have? How were you able to get him to do his household chores? The biggest thing I would say with stuff like that is um, you have to break it down for them. So, you know, before I really understood how Andrew's brain worked, you know, saying to him, you know, go clean your room is not, you know, that's that's not going to work. He'll be sitting in his room. He'll start to clean it and then he'll find something that, you know, was buried under a pile of I don't even know what, like, you know, for the past six months. And he'll be like, oh, this is cool. And then I'll start playing with it. And an hour later, he's still sitting on the floor and nothing's been cleaned up. You know, it's OK if it takes your child three or four days to clean their room and you can break it down, break chores down into small things. If I said to him, you know, I want you to do these three things. I want you to put your clothes in the hamper. I want you to clean up the trash in your room. And I want you to straighten up the papers on your desk. He could do that and he could do it um, with very little difficulty because it, th these were three very specific tasks. Because when they look at, you know, um, clean your room or go get dressed or go get ready for for practice, it's overwhelming. They look at the whole thing. They don't, they can't break it down. Okay, so if I'm, going to get ready for school, I have to brush my teeth, I got to put my clothes on, and I have to come down and eat breakfast. Um, very distinct tasks that if you s let them know the specific tasks, you'll have much more success with having your child being able to complete them. But seeing a, a, a big picture is very overwhelming. So clean your room, they see the entire room. They don't, and it's just, they can't even focus on a singular thing in the room that needs to be done. Um, but breaking the tasks down into very specific things. And that works with anything. Um, studying for a test, you know, work with your child. Okay, so on Tuesday night, what chapters do you want to study or what things do you want to study? And, you know, have your child write that down. Okay, th that, you know, Tuesday night, these are the only two things that you do. Um, and it it hel helps them be much more successful when, when they have things that are broken up and tasks are very specific. Um, Andrew, actually, when he was younger, he really liked a timer. I, I would tell him, you have 15 minutes to 
clean up the toys in the, in the room here and put them away. And then you can do, get to do whatever you want, you know, have a half hour of whatever you want to do before you went to bed. And he was very good actually at, at doing that. And this was before we knew he had ADHD. <laughs> um, so yeah, so a timer might work to help kids with chores. And like I said, don't, don't expect them to do everything all at once. Just they can do it in little bits and, you know, it's more of that, let go of how it's supposed to be done. You, you don't have to do it all at once. It's okay if you don't. <laughs> yes, thank you. As a follow-up, um, in addition to the chores, so I, I, I get the chores and um, we do checklists and things like that. But my children, they struggle greatly with um, doing any, I, I hate to say anything, but when it comes to getting dressed to go outside, um, signing, uh, getting uh, dressed to go to, or even leaving to go to uh, extracurricular activity that I've, mm -hmm you know, sign them up for because I believe they're interested in it. When it comes to the day to go to the class, they, they both um, resist going um, to- And they're homeschooled. And they're homeschooled. So our okay. things are around, you know, extra extracurricular and their co-op, pretty much any, again, I hate to say in anything, but most, I would say 90% of the things that we ask them to um, do outside of the home, they resist. Um, is that typical? <laughs> Well, Andrew didn't have problems doing things out of out of the house, but I, I think I would really assess if your kids are really interested in those uh, activities. And I think they get stuck in a like um, they'll get stuck where they don't want to stop doing a task and move on to the next task. They have trouble with that. I'm having it's, too much fun doing what I was doing before. Yeah, yeah it's I, called I, set switching. So they can't stop a, an inappropriate task to move on to the appropriate task. And one thing maybe you might want to try is talking to them about um, expectations and what's going to happen. And uh, I know for Andrew, for a while, I would give him a 15 minute heads up that in 15 minutes, you're going to have to stop playing the video game and you're going to have to start doing your homework because they get so involved in what they're doing. I, I, I liked activity that they have trouble stopping doing that activity. So if you say, okay, well, on Tuesday at this time, you know, we're going to go and do this activity and I will remind you or let you know, you know, a half hour, 15 minutes, whatever, before that you have that much more time to continue on the activity that you're doing and you're going to have to wrap that up so that we can move on to something else. And I will say it does get better as it goes along because now I can go from playing a video game to out of my room, walking down the hallway for my first class, like, like that, like, I have a nice clock on my desk and that helps me know. And I, I learned this from my mom. I set my clock on my desk fast. So I leave early and I get there early. Yeah. And that's a good point. There's actually, there's a lot of different timers out there. We never, well, I think you had one, but, um, and they don't even have like numbers on them, but they have uh, like a color that kind of gets less and less as the time goes down. So maybe like a visual um, representation of the passage of time, because they do have trouble with, um, time, knowing how much time has passed. Uh, so, you know, they think they're in there doing something for 10 minutes and no, you've been up there doing that for an hour because they don't, they have a, they have difficulty. Happen again, we're just having too time. much fun. You know, it's just like, you know, uh, time flies when you're having fun. So. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, a timer might be a visual timer. The kids with ADHD are very visual. So a visual timer might, um, help in, letting your kids know that, okay, in this amount of time, we're gonna have to go out to the extracurricular activities. If your child is um, diagnosed, uh, get them a 504 plan and that uh, that can carry over into college as well. So through high school and into college, um, you know, and definitely have them when the school allows have them participate in their 504 meetings for sure. For our students who are like 14 years and older, they get to sit in on their 504 meetings and their IEP meetings. That's where they start the process of advocating for themselves. That's where they start the process of learning that language. Um, and sometimes they are a little afraid, but allow them to speak for themselves and, 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 and tell the team, slow down. If they're using technical language, slow down, explain that. And so that's really important if your kiddo is of age and can attend those meetings, that's that first step towards self-advocacy because at the college level, that disability office wants to know what has been successful for you in the past. What have you used in the past? 
And so some of that may be, you know, recorders or smart pens and all of the things that we have available at the college level. So just keep some of those things in mind, you know, as we're talking about, you know, strategies and some of the things that they can do in high school and post-secondary. You know, I could tell them physically, hey, I like this idea and no, I don't like that idea or this accommodation, I almost never use it. So I don't think it needs to be on there, things like that. We have talked with teachers, counselors, and even the superintendent. And their excuse for not over plan is that he said, my son's academic record is not bad enough. Even his psychologist said he need one, just like what you said, you know, he has to take a break. He has to have a note. And uh, I mean, the teachers support that, but I think the school just don't want to offer it for whatever the strange reason. But yeah, kids can um, compensate well um, in terms of grades. Grades ha have absolutely nothing to do with having ADHD. They do struggle academically, but they're also able to compensate for um, like, so you don't turn in several homework assignments and you do bad on this quiz, but then you get like, you know, an A on the exam. So they can compensate for their grades. I would keep pushing the um, the issue. How did you manage studying and remembering material for exams? When I would do homework in high school, I would have my room with all the fun stuff. And I'd have the homework area downstairs with nothing fun. I would have my laptop and I'd get my homework done down there. And then I'd go upstairs and play games on my computer. So like, I have the watchful eye of mom walk in, so I'd have to be stealthy if I ever tried to do anything. Not that I ever would, but yeah, the environment's good and like the walking around, I can relate to that. I love to get up and walk around. Like if I'm doing homework, I'll take a break and uh we have a nice long hallway and uh learning to play hockey. So I'll just go shoot some hockey pucks at a net we have and then I'll come back and do my homework. But yeah, make a plan for studying. Don't be like, all right, study day. It's not study day, it's one of your study days. And you should have a study like weekend and break it up so you're not studying for four exams in classes you didn't pay attention to for half the semester all in one day because you're like i have to learn this and i don't know what this is and what does that greek letter mean it's like no break it up do it because if you don't do if you try to do it all in one day you're going to be like you're just you're just going to want to do it even less and you're not going to retain any of the information because you'll be like you'll just be hard stuck on the mindset of, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to be here. I just want to go home. I don't want to take my exams and you'll be focusing too much on getting done with it, that you'll, you'll do it just to do it and not keep any so, of the information. Um, one of the things that you said, Andrew, about um, breaking things up into smaller tasks and just having that calendar, the calendar is, like you said, it, it cannot be underrated as a powerful tool. And, and when you have ownership, meaning like if you're a high school student, when you have ownership over your calendar and you choose what you put on it and when you put on it because it works best for you, it becomes like your best friend. Uh, the other thing that you mentioned about medication, I think that's extremely important because some of our parents are afraid, you know, that if that the medication is going to be something that they can't do without. But while we're in the midst of a medication shortage, it, it's I think it's very, very like encouraging to know, hey, we actually can put together a toolbox full of different coping skills and strategies that like legit work, but we still got to use like we got to work it. So I love how you mentioned the fact that you once you develop a coping strategy, you got to keep using it because that's what makes it, um, you know, extremely helpful in mitigating whatever circumstances. And then the other thing that was mentioned about um, about intelligence not being a predictor of having a diagnosis of ADHD, I think that that's extremely important to know that you, you can be extremely intelligent and do very well and still deal with the diagnosis and still need resources. And um, the last thing I'll say, and I promise this is the last thing I'm going to say, the lack of resources and coping skills and strategies is what equates to having all of these problems in adulthood. A lot of kids don't outgrow ADHD, but they do grow up. And so when they're growing up and they're living and working, they can con 
can have a ton of like issues, personal issues, like keeping a job or um, maintaining a place to live, um, getting all these parking tickets or speeding tickets. And, and, you know, there's all kind of different things that are happening on a personal level that they might not even talk about. And being able to build effective coping skills early on and making sure that you're using them allows you to avoid a lot of that stuff in into adulthood. Um, and I, I will uh, just add a final thing there that, um, you know, you know, Andrew goes to college, but we weren't uh, sure that Andrew was going to go to college after high school. And, you know, that kind of comes back again to the, you know, do it your way and let go of what um, the preconceived notion is of what you're supposed to do. So, you know, if you don't go to college after high school, it's, it's okay. <laughs> it's, you know, that's not a rule that that has to happen. And Andrew actually, um, through his high school, he could go to the technical college and he could take classes. So he did become a certified network engineer. Um, and, you know, that was an option when he graduated from high school, that if he didn't go to college, that you know, he could do that. So there are, are other avenues that you can investigate um, for your child. Another one is he was interested in going in the Coast Guard. So he took the um, military entrance exam in high school. It was offered by the high school and he did, you know, extremely well on it. So that was also an option. So there are other options for your child if they want to take a gap year or if they, you know, decide that college isn't for them, because if you push them into that and they don't really want to go, then that's just going to, you know, they're going to fail. And then, you know, they're, they're, they're not feeling good about themselves. You're not feeling good because, you know, they've, they've now failed. So, um, you know, keep an open mind when helping your child choose their path. Whatever your accomplishments are, celebrate them. That is so important to take the time to celebrate you and your achievements. So thank you all for being here.